Good morning again, and I'm so pleased to welcome you once more to our Symposium on Artificial Intelligence here at Trinity. We have guests watching on our live stream, as well as a full house here in O'Connor Auditorium. We have a wonderful day that's planned. We welcome once again all of our alumni here for reunion, all of our students, faculty, and staff, and also a number of friends and colleagues from the business community and the community at large, everyone so eager to learn about artificial intelligence and how we can make it work for us productively. Joining me on stage right now are our keynote speaker, Mr. Bryce Hall of McKinsey, who we'll hear from in a minute, and two students who will facilitate introductions and the Q&A part of our program. Maria Salace Nava is a senior biochemistry major. She's a superstar in the sciences, I can tell you. She wins prizes all over the place. And she's president of our Student Government Council as well. She has a lot going on here. And with her is Junior Haywan Deas, a junior psychology major with minors in business and global affairs, and she too wins prizes and is all over the place. Another great student leader. Welcome. I'm going to turn it over to Maria to introduce Mr. Hall. Maria. Thank you, President McGuire. Um, Bryce Hall leads the development of McKinsey's proprietary digital and analytics assessment tools. He also co-led the development of McKinsey's digital and analytics transformation playbook. He serves companies across industries and has particular expertise in consumer, healthcare, and the financial services sector. A graduate of Cornell and the Yale School of Management, Mr. Hall has written extensively on the digital transformation of artificial intelligence. His most recent publication, The State of AI in 2023, Generative AI's Breakout Year, states that the expected business disruption from Gen AI is significant and business leaders predict meaningful changes to their workforces. They anticipate workforce cuts in certain areas and large reskilling efforts to address shifting talent needs. Everyone, please welcome me in joining, please join me in welcoming Mr. Bryce Hall. <laughs> Is this Hello, can you hear me? It's an honor to be here. I'm really excited to talk with you all today about digital transformations, about AI, and about our work at McKinsey, and what we see as some of the trends, and really excited to cover this, top, this set of uh, content, but then leave a lot of time for discussion and, um, discussion and, uh, and questions at the end also. Maybe I'll start with Rewired. This came about about six years ago when we were, as a firm, trying to understand what is it that companies are doing to allow them to capture value from digital and AI technologies. And so we started by just looking at, of all the companies we work with, the ones that were successful, not just digital natives, like many of the Silicon Valley leading companies, but legacy companies, banks, heavy industrial companies, airlines, healthcare companies. What were they doing to allow them to be successful? And so uh, when we talk about a digital and AI playbook, we developed this at McKinsey five or six years ago, and every year we've refreshed it because we always knew that it would be an evergreen set of content. In parallel, I've been involved with our AI global research, and it's a tremendously exciting time to be involved in this, in this field. Um, um, President McGuire, the, the lead-in was fantastic in, in just shaping up what an innovative, exciting time this is. Um, the CEO of Google described that the, the work in AI is as profound to humanity as, as fire <laughs> and, and electricity. And so the, the changes other people have described AI as dazzling. And so there are really two parts of this story, the, the, the tremendous innovation and opportunity that we see, and then the second piece is the real challenges and risks. So we'll talk through both of those sides of the story uh, in this discussion. 
Uh, President McGuire asked me to, in the first part of this, just describe and level set at the beginning a little bit of the foundational context. How do we describe AI? Machine learning, deep learning, generative AI. What are some of the trends that we see that are influencing that? And then in the second part, we'll look at some of the research from Rewired and what we see in companies actually implementing these and some of the learnings and lessons on, on, on that. So on context, the, the first is what are some of the trends that we see that have really shaped this you know, quite explosive growth and interest in AI and generative AI? The first is just vast availability of more data through uh, you know, all kinds of sources, through social media, through mobile, through, through cloud applications, customer expectations. All of us are used to the functionality of pick your favorite uh, you know, app, whether it's Uber or your Bank of America app or Netflix. The level of personalization and functionality, what we have found in working with companies is that customers get used to that. You expect that same level of service now from your post office or you expect that from, you know, from your, uh, you know, any of the other companies that you work with. And, and people get frustrated then when that isn't, um, you know, isn't consistent. Clearly, faster processors, an order of magnitude, more quickly able to process large amounts of data, the migration over the past 10 years of all of the data to the cloud, and cloud native applications make much more accessible a lot of these tools. Um, and then just commoditized algorithms. We'll talk through a little bit just the improvement that we see in some of the models and algorithms that are able to, to, uh, to work with these vast amounts of data. This is a chart that just illustrates a number of the data sources and many of them you're, you're familiar with and interact with on a daily basis, but all of this data is now available to provide insights to, to offer you better service, to offer you more personalization, to predict what you're going to do next, to predict what, you're, what purchases you're going to make, if you're likely to um, drop a subscription. Uh, at the same time, the cost of data storage has gone down, and so the inverse curves that we see on both of these have led to, in some ways, we talk about a threshold of commercial viability. So, whereas before, fewer data sources and much higher cost meant that a lot of these applications just weren't that commercially viable. But the trend lines of both of these means that many companies now can use vast amounts of data and these insights um, in commercial applications that are now profitable to do so. And what that has meant at a macro level is that there are certain companies that are doing really well in this space and have reached a tipping point and ultimately what we'll see is I think more of this trend where companies that are doing this well will be successful, and many of them are, you know, we use all the time. Most of us, or many of us, use Amazon or have a subscription to Netflix or, um, you know, any any of these examples where they're using vast amounts of data and they're providing a higher quality of service. And companies that are legacy companies that aren't keeping up with that trend, many of them are struggling. Some of them have gone bankrupt. Um, but there's no doubt, I mean, everyone can see the trend that Blockbuster was not able to compete with the trend lines of you know, online video streaming and Netflix. And that dynamic basically is, is playing out in acro across a lot of other sectors as well. A few just foundational comments on these different tiers of, or categories of, of algorithms. So broadly, the term artificial intelligence is why we're all here today. But you also, I'm sure, have engaged with terms like you know, machine learning or deep learning, generative AI, particularly over the past year. These are, the simplest way to describe them are subcategories of sophistication of algorithms. And another point to make is that 
Artificial intelligence is not particularly new. Artificial intelligence was, was talked about and evolved in the 1950s, uh, machine learning in the 1960s through the 1980s. But at its basic form, and, and um, President McGuire referenced this, the initial discussion around artificial intelligence was computers or technologies that could mimic human behavior. But humans have lots of different, exhibit lots of types of behavior. And so in sort of early forms, rule-based computational sophistication was quite marvelous and mimicked human behavior um, and had better human performance than you know, people um, sort of manually doing calculations. Rules-based uh, algorithms evolved to be able to be competitive with the world's top chess players, for example, and struck people as mimicking human behavior and, in fact, in some ways outperforming human behavior. When we see characteristics of machine learning in the 60s and sort of through the 80s, the really at the core was the ability of these models to use large data sets and then to be able to learn from those and adapt their approach. And so the machine learning models that are incredibly sophisticated at detecting fraud, for example, or patterns in data, um, predicting churn or predicting propensity to, to, to buy a product, all of those are really at the core of machine, machine learning algorithms. In more recently, um, around 10 or 15 years ago, in the evolution of deep learning, you, you may have heard you know, neural networks or layered computational nodes uh, in algorithms that mimic the structure of a human brain. And the ability of deep learning algorithms, you know, subset of AI, to be able to use that data massive quantities of data to be able to do pattern recognition. So a lot of the marvelous uh, voice recognition abilities or image pattern recognition uh, is, is really at the core of, if, of, of the sort of deep learning subset. And then really, this, this most recent publication that, that, that we published in, uh, in Q1 of this year was the state of AI in 2023, generative AI's breakout year. And the reason we refer to it as a breakout year is the vast awareness and excitement and energy around these new proliferation of generative AI tools and applications. Um, ChatGPT is, is just one of them, but, but I think that's why most of us are here. It's, it, they, they truly are dazzling and shocking in some ways and really strike at the core of, um, you know, in an education context, uh, you know, what is at the heart of teaching someone and learning and human sort of synthesis. Um, but, but a lot of that is really just over the past year in the generative AI applications reaching a threshold of commercial viability. A couple words on sort of generative AI, gen, generative AI and you know, how it works. <laughs> so part of it is that generative AI models are able to ingest a, a colossally sort of unfathomable amount of data. You know, they are trained on huge swaths of data that's available online. So um, many of the foundational models for generative AI are trained on you know, 420 terabytes of data um, you know, more knowledge and content that is available in, in uh, certainly in, in the largest university libraries, but just uh, in images and, and code. And then they're fed into what they call transformer models that use some of, we talked about a few minutes ago about the increased processing power. They use these, this increased processing power to pre-train the model on certain tranches of data and then they end up outputting models that are used for specific tasks. So ChatGPT, for example, is one of the models that is output from these, these, these transformer models that's used to generate text. And so you can enter in a prompt. I, many are, how many people, if you raise your hand, have used some form of ChatGPT or a 
Yeah. Um, and we'll talk through a little bit, you know, your experiences with that. But that is a model that has been trained on vast amounts of language text and can predict the next strings of text that you're, you know, you're thinking. And it can synthesize that and, and, and generate content. But the amount of training that it's done before you sort of enter into, enter into that prompt is quite extraordinary. One GPU, one sort of processing uh, computer has spent 32 years ingesting and studying all of that data, and it's, it's prepared for your, for your prompt. So G the GPT of chat is generative, pre-trained, transformer. So chat, generative, pre-trained, transformer. So it's a generative model. It's been pre-trained on all of this language text, and it's a transformer model that you know is one of the underpinnings to, to be able to enable that. Some of the applications that have gotten a lot of attention recently, uh, some of you may be familiar with many of these. I also included the the, the Pope in a puffer jacket because it's a Catholic <laughs> university, and it was so, you know, so um, he looks great in it. <laughs> But a, an AI image won an art prize um, in the Colorado State Fair. And this was with trained art critics and, and experts not knowing that it was generated by a generative AI, um, DALI or Stable Diffusion. Or, you know, there, there are a number of these. But it was so credible and sophisticated that it actually ended up winning the, the, the prize at this, at this fair. Chat, chat, chatbot passed the bar exam. Um, and one of the paradoxes that we see with, with some of these generative AI tools is that they're super sophisticated in certain areas, like being able to pass a bar exam. I personally could not pass a bar exam. But they trip over things that, um, that are much less sophisticated. And so you know, a, a friend of mine posted, what do we make of a technology that, that is so sophisticated that it can pass the bar exam, but it stumbles over you know, tasks that, that many toddlers can, um, can accomplish? And so sometimes that's referred to as the jagged frontier, but there's a, there's a wild unevenness in things that chat GPT can do well, credibly, and things that it struggles with. And so it's good to you know, be clear-eyed about that and to know, you know <laughs> which of those it falls into. The third tile here is around code generation. So it's not just text or images. It can generate actual c code. And so companies that have vast teams, sometimes some you know, major multinational banks may have 2,000 um, people in their center of analytics and software designers and coders. They are able now to use things like GitHub Copilot to generate code 50% more quickly. So there's just you know, marvelous advancements in this. And then, of course, some of the deep fake images that even if you are aware and are really looking for it, they can you know, fool you into thinking that it was a real, a real photograph. So they're just, I mean, marvelous and also um, inherently um, problematic in a lot of ways, too. This is just a chart that illustrates the rapid pace of adoption. So the, the early version of ChatGPT, ChatGPT3, it took 24 months to get to a million users. GitHub Copilot is the application that I referenced a minute ago around code generation. It took eight months to get to a million uh, users. Dolly is one of the image generating um, applications. There are a number of them, um, Stable Diffusion, Midjourney, and others, but Dolly is one of the better known ones. It took two and a half months. ChatGPT4 reached a million users in five days. Uh, the barrier to entry, meaning you know, how hard is it to adopt the, the new technology, is quite low. Um, one of the things that was striking in our latest round of research was just looking at by age group, by seniority. Um, I mean, everyone um, is, is playing with, adopting, is, you know, using these technologies in part because it's, it, it's so compelling and because it's so easy to do so. You have, if you have an internet connection and a browser, you can sign up for, a, for, a, for an account to be able to use these technologies. On a macro level, we are quite optimistic about the economic potential from Gen AI. So this is a chart that shows 
economic potential from AI, the sort of first column, the incremental impact from generative AI applications, uh, and then the, the, the third, but it's, you know, it's on the order of you know, between 15 and 20 trillion dollars of economic value. So whether it's through growth, through cost efficiencies, through increased um, customer experience and so forth. And then the third column is just efficiencies through the workforce. And this is just a broad category of applications where it just makes it more efficient to do daily tasks. So if you're writing an email, if you're writing a meeting summary, you know, if you are generating a draft copy of something, there's just like a broad swath of things that our workforce globally takes time to do on a daily, weekly, monthly basis now that these tools will make more efficient. Um, and so there, there's a lot of value potential you know, in all of that as well. When we think about generative AI, in some cases people talk about generative AI as a monolithic thing. And the, 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 the one that people most often talk about is text generation. So like the, because ChatGPT in particular has gotten so much attention and because so many people can use it, it's really become vastly democratized. And so we've come up with this bucketing of, of generative AI opportunities because we find it a helpful construct. The chat GPT, GitHub Copilot are all in this first category of taker applications. Um, meaning that you can just use those essentially off the shelf. You don't need to tune the model, you don't need to train it on any data, you don't need to have any kind of tech infrastructure or you know, d data systems to be able to use it. it, it is, you can really use those primarily as is for a broad set of valuable applications. In the middle, there's a set of applications where you take a generative AI model, but then you train it on your data. So if you're an insurance company, or you know, pick, pick a company, if you would have most value of training a foundation model on all of your customer data, on insurance data, um, so that you can better predict fraud, for example, or you can predict who's gonna be able to pay their mortgage, or you can train a set of hundreds of call agents when someone calls the bank to know their transaction history and to be able to anticipate you know, why they're calling and how to resolve their problem efficiently, for example. But that, that requires taking some of these generative AI tools and having a data infrastructure, tech infrastructure, training it on your, you know, your data to be able to, to use it. And that's all in the middle category. On the maker category, it is to say there are certain applications where the existing foundation models aren't sufficient. So Bloomberg, for example, is developing their own foundation models for financial services. Um, insurance companies are doing you know, similar thing. Uh, some of the pharmaceutical companies, similarly, they view an opportunity in drug creation, and so they are making massive investments in those. But those are much more time-consuming, uh, expensive, and a much more limited set of those. But they're all in the category of gener generative AI opportunities. Um, but to give an order of magnitude, the taker ones you know, are free for everyone to use. We don't view those to be tremendously differentiating. Almost all of us at some point are gonna be, be using those, adopting them. They're, they're not, um, there's no barrier to entry, so most companies are gonna do that. In the middle category, on the order of magnitude, it may cost $10 million and six to eight months to or to 12 months to sort of identify a shaper opportunity and to implement it. For companies on the sort of category three, on just order of magnitude might be, you know, 12 to 18 months and on the order of like $100 million to be able to develop a foundation model. And then the, the, we're almost done with the sort of foundational concepts and then we'll get into some actual like, you know, business applications. Um, we have also looked at, of all the generative AI opportunities, and you know, I mentioned that they're lumpy. The, some of them are great, they're great at certain things, they trip over other things. These are actually four archetypes that generative AI is actually really good at. Generative AI is really good at generating content. So if you're a marketer and you spend your day writing copy or coming up with ad campaigns or new ideas for a Nike 10 issue, 
Generative AI actually does a really good job of that in sort of a first pass. It's really good at code acceleration if, you're, if you have you know, software coders. It's actually really good at synthesis and advising like as a virtual expert role. And it's also really good in the fourth category of, of uh, customer services and engagement. Call centers uh, are adopting this or will be adopting this at scale. It's, it's just tremendously valuable. It can, some, you pick up the phone and, and your virtual agent can give you a draft script of you know, how to interact with them. If you're in a university development office and you're writing letters to alumni, you can pretty quickly generate a letter that feels tailored and incorporates their history and you know their experiences. Um, this is a lot of small text, but the, the 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 illustration here is of a major bank, and at the top we we describe the value chain of an of a company. So for a bank. There's a value chain in the same way there is for an insurance company or a healthcare organization, and it includes a set of things like sales distribution, pricing and risk assessment, um, servicing operations, but all of the different activities within any company. And this bank has gone through the exercise of saying which of these are heavily impacted by gener generative AI, or the ones in the darkest tiles versus like medium impact versus not, not really at all impacted by these new set of tools. And almost every company that we work with today is going through some version of this exercise. Um, and in part it is where can we continue to have a competitive advantage? Some of it is where is there a truly an existential threat to our business model? And the dark tiles are the ones where companies are actually implementing these solutions in various ways. So some of them we just talked about, like virtual agents and content creation in certain areas. The last topic in this section is around risks. Uh, I, I heard, um, I was actually interviewed for a, um, for a piece on, on risk, and I mentioned that I had heard someone describe that we have opened Jurassic, with, with AI, where we are with AI right now is that we have opened Jurassic Park, but we haven't yet installed the electric fences. <laughs> and this got quoted and McKinsey ended up sharing this out with five million of our LinkedIn followers. And so I woke up in the morning and saw this on my LinkedIn feed and, and had a little bit of a hard palpitation. But, um, but it captures, I think, some of the risks, um, again, that President McGuire, I think, nicely articulated at the beginning around risks to our democracy, <laughs> around um, risk that things are just gonna be shared that are inaccurate, risks that a lot of people's hard work and IP will be incorporated into these models but not properly attributed. Um, risk that of all this data that these models are incorporating, it's not always clear what data it has used to generate the output. And so the traceability, the kind of, um, auditability of AI and generative AI in particular is really tricky. So if you're a bank regulator and you want to know precisely how the algorithm determined who got a mortgage and who didn't, with a previous model you can do that. It's rules based and you can say, yeah, we, we didn't approve this mortgage or you know, someone um, was in this category of output for this particular reason. For AI and for generative AI, that link, it, that link isn't as traceable or auditable. So these are a set of risks. Some of them have exist, existed previously. We've used AI, I mean, we broadly, industry has used AI to identify fraud or um, to determine who gets sort of certain offers for a credit card, for example, for a long time. And some of these, exists, these risks existed previously. The change now, I think, is that it's become much more democratized, just the awareness of AI and generative AI, and some of these risks are truly novel with some of the new technologies, and then some of it is just now people are more aware of it than they were even just eight, 10, 12 months ago. So now if we pivot a little bit to how do companies actually implement a digital and AI solution We'll cover this quite quickly too, and let's see, do a time check. Um, so we have enough time for questions. 
What we have found is that today, almost every company has some form of a digital or AI transformation in progress. Every bank, every healthcare company, um, some transition to digital health records, um, every, every airline. Um, but what we found is that there's really quite mixed success in capturing true value from that. Only 30% of the expected value, um, only 25% of the expected cost reductions. And that was really the, the whole point of doing this research and writing this book, was like, what are the successful companies doing that actually enable them to, to capture value? So in this first set, we, we looked at retail banking, in part because retail banking has been further along this journey and earlier, and because we just have a tremendous amount of data from customer transactions, um, from major institutions. And so we looked at 80 global banks, and we looked over time, over the past five, six years, we compared their financial metrics with a set of uh, operational metrics. So we looked at adoption of a mobile app, for example. We looked at di sales through a digital channel, and we looked at contact center staffing, just to list three of them. Almost everyone has a relationship with a financial institution, and most people have, a, have by this point, downloaded some sort of app to be able to interact with them, to deposit a check, to be able to check your balance, to be able to send money to someone, um, in some cases to do more sophisticated transactions like get a, like an auto loan or a home equity loan or so forth. What we found is that there's always been a delta between the leaders and the laggards, the leaders, those financial outperformers and the laggards that are lacking. Um, over time though, it's really become table stakes. Having a mobile app, every bank needs to have some sort of mobile app. Um, on digital sales, we do see that the leaders over time have really grown that gap in part because it's just more complex. Um, historically, if you wanted to do one of those more complicated transactions, even to deposit a check, you would go into a banking, you'd go into a physical branch bank to do many of those things. Um, now you can do some of the more simple ones like depositing a check on your phone. Um, but many people still go into a branch for things like an auto loan or a home equity loan or a mortgage. Um, but sophisticated banks have gotten really good even at some of those, those, those transactions. What we found was that over time, the biggest difference was not the fact whether they had an app or whether they had some of the functionality through a digital channel, but how well they executed it and how well they, quote, rewired the rest of their organization to be able to, to, to do that. At the lagging banks, they launched digital apps and they created digital channels, but their call center volumes actually went up, which is really counterintuitive. The whole point of doing these digital channels is that you don't need as many people to you know, man be in the branches ha handling face-to-face -face transactions. You don't need as many people in the call center. People can do it self-serve through a digital channel. But it's actually really tough to do that because all of the different processes under in an organization need to be aligned to that. The way that you approve, approve a mortgage, for example, or the way that you assess risk needs to be all that data, all of the, the processes, the seamless transaction. I mean, all of us, how many of you have been in a situation where you're trying to do something online or on an app and you get kind of hung up? Yeah, and how many of you were frustrated by that experience? <laughs> yeah, how many of you have called into a call center? as a result of that, and, and waited a long time, and fa found that experience frustrating. Um, and so that is you know, this column here of, even though you know, banks have, and in this example, banks have in, you know, inter introduced these technologies, the ones that haven't done it particularly well haven't seen value capture from that. They frustrated their customers, <laughs> and they haven't actually realized the full benefit of that um, technology. The leading banks, have actually gotten really good at that. And so you can get through that whole transaction at, at, your, at your leisure in a satisfying way, you know, accomplish whatever you, you set out to do versus having to drive to the branch and you know, spend a lot of time in line and so forth. This is, this is an example of that, a, a regional bank that implemented a home equity loan solution. So um, if you look at the landscape of banking companies, 
there are majors in this country, um, JP Morgan and Bank of America and others that, that have scale and they have a competitive advantage for that reason. They can make major investments in technologies. Regional banks and credit unions aren't as, um, aren't, don't have the scale, they don't have the large data sets, they aren't able to make as big investments, so they have to be more targeted in how they competitively differentiate. This is a regional bank that decided they wanted to create a competitive advantage in home equity loans because the experience of doing that still today is quite clunky and time consuming. If you have a mortgage on your home and you have equity in, that, in your house and you want to sort of take out a loan for whatever reason, you know, it can take three weeks, four weeks to go through that process before you get a deposit in your, in your account to be able to do something with it. And so they targeted creating a seamless digital experience where you could, in a, on a digital device or you know, on your computer, apply for that that they would be able to use all of the available data about you to determine if you know, your house is, is sort of worth what, what it, sort of to appraise your house, to understand um, how much equity you have, to be able to understand your credit risk, and to be able to approve that um, instantly or, or quickly, uh, and to be able to get money from a home equity loan in seven days. But all of the things on this page need to be in place to make that a seamless, successful, situation because otherwise it'll be the situation that we sort of looked at a lot of hands being raised with sort of frustrating experience through that process a lot of people you know calling into the call center and not being able to, to sort of accomplish that and so they actually implemented all of this through again like rewiring the organization and they now are the number one national um, issuer of home equity loans so a regional bank identifying a value opportunity executing it really well, able to outplay some of the, the major banking companies because they executed it well and they used these technologies um, to be able to do that. Another example, I've, I've shared just a couple here to illustrate the broad applicability of this. One of the things that gets me so excited in working in this field is just the innovation of all of these applications. Every company, this is a heavy mining example. So we looked at banking, healthcare, insurance, and education. Every company, every sector that we work with is identifying these, these new tools, identifying how they can create value, and then figuring out a way to implement them. In this case, it's a copper mining company that implemented an AI engine at the center um, if you think of a copper mining organization, I'm not sure that that's probably what comes to mind, but it is you know, a sophisticated um, AI at the center um, model that's taking inputs through sensors all across the mining operation that is able to optimize what they call the set points. So you know, the kind of ore coming in from the, the copper mine and it has a series of crushers and a series of baths and chemical kind of things that at the end of the day the goal is to output copper from this, this mine. But the way that you set the parameters of all of those various points along the mine influence the, the main thing that they, their, their main KPI if you will or success metric is throughput and yield. How much can they get through this center mining operation and how much yield, how much copper does it yield from all of that. And through implementing this AI solution, they were able to increase the throughput and yield 15%, which may not sound like a lot, but at the end of the day that equates to, for a large mining operation, 200 million tons of copper every five years, which is the equivalent of them having to build a whole nother mine. And for a mining operation, you can't just build another whole other mine. You have to permit it. They estimate that it takes eight to ten years to get through the process of actually, you know, opening up a new facility, and about a billion dollars um, because it's hugely expensive. A lot of capital outlay to be able to do that. And so now, through implementing an AI solution, they're able to increase significantly the throughput and yield, the, the production of this copper mine. So all of the environmental um, you know, efficiencies of that and cost efficiencies are, you know, part of this AI solution in a, like, heavy legacy industry. It's not particularly one that, you know, that I would have thought of is, um, 
is applicable for, you know, for a digital or AI solution. And it's one of the reasons I like love this example. Um, I may skip over this quickly so we can have enough time for, uh, for questions. The, the last thing I'll leave you with is the main anchoring framework of, of Rewired is that there are six elements that successful companies get right that allow them to capture value from digital and from AI. And th they're sort of th this framework on this page. The, the overall strategic roadmap, they align on a North Star vision. They understand by business domain across the value chain where their big sources of value and then they prioritize those. On talent, they understand what resources they need. They develop a talent model to be able to attract, retain, and excite them. On an operating model, there are lots of things of transitioning from uh, legacy ways of doing things and legacy team setups to agile teams to sometimes we call a product and platform operating model. So it's how you create an engine of being able to get from idea to implementation quickly. Um, there are core elements of technology, of being able to assetize, uh, being able to use certain segments of code and, and, of, um, and data sets repeatedly for other applications. And then on adoption and scaling, the last one we'll say is companies always under-index on how hard change really is. And what we have found, although it's one of the six elements on this page, more than half of the time and resources are required in, in change, change management, in rewiring processes. To use the insurance example, it may be well and good to identify a solution for digital and AI to accomplish this process, but all of the agents that are writing policies, if they've done that for 20 years, they're not going to sort of shift overnight to a new like, way of doing things. Um, even if it may be, you know, tremendously more valuable or accurate process. So all of the incentives, training, change management, um, all of those things are, you know, inherent in the adoption and scaling um, dimension. So I will, I will pause there. I would really love to hear your questions and reflections on all of this. There's actually more content here, so if, if we want, we can jump around and cover some of it in more detail, but I think it may be, may be best just to hear from you. Um, some of your, your reflections. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you very much. We actually have our first question from Haywan here. So, Haywan, and do you want to talk into the microphone? Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so, President McGuire did mention about, you know, preparing students, Trinity students, for the future in the workforce, right? Um, so, in terms of banking and copper mining and all of that, the question that I have is, you know, what advice do you have for current Trinity students um, to be prepared for the workforce? Yeah. I, uh, a few ways to think about that. One is that these technologies are evolving quickly. Many of the things I talked about today will evolve really significantly in the next year or two years, and every industry will continue to evolve. It's, it's not going away. It's transforming each of these companies and each of these sectors. So part of it, I think, is, is having a mindset of continued learning. So this content can be intimidating. When I started at McKinsey 11 years ago, none of this existed at, at McKinsey. Um, we now have 9,000 employees with profiles that McKinsey didn't even, didn't exist or didn't hire for. Data scientists, data engineers, cloud architects, um, agile coaches, um, and all of those skill sets are things that have evolved in a, in a reasonably short period of time. And so having a continual learning mindset I think is really important. It's, it's all well and good to know like the technologies of today, but those just quite surely will continue to evolve. Um, and then you can also, I think, within each sector, develop a set of skills that prepare you for you know, the jobs that are available today. So you can talk with people who are in whatever field you're interested in and understand what, how those roles are, ro roles are evolving and, and changing. I also have another question. 
questions, that's okay? Yes, please. <laughs> uh, so your paper mentions, um, and even in the presentation, about you know the risks um, with AI. So the question that I have, I mean, some of them were like inaccuracy and cybersecurity. These are big things. So uh, my question is, do you think these questions or these risks are like big enough for the federal government to be involved um, and for regulation to happen for artificial intelligence? Yeah, so the short answer is yes. The, the, um, at the beginning we talked about there are really two parts of this story. One is tremendous opportunity, innovation, value creation from these new technologies. The other is like real risks and uh, sort of challenges that they pose. On the very real risks and challenges they pose, we are in early days of figuring out, identifying them and figuring out how to mitigate each of these. Um, every company that is exploring these opportunities is acutely aware of them. In certain sectors that are more heavily regulated, like healthcare, for example, or banking, um, a number of the implementation of the technologies is lagging uh, because the regulatory framework will just take a longer time to, to catch up. But the, the short answer to your question is, I think we all agree, and you've heard this from some of the some of the, the leaders of these large companies like OpenAI and Google and others saying we need rules of the game and we need to identify certain boundary conditions that um, protect our elections, that you know protect um, individual, you know. And the the other thing I would say is that individual companies are evaluating and implementing risk mitigation. So in implementing a number of these image generating tools and in chat GPT um, each of these companies has gone through a set of beta testing and sometimes they call it red teaming and so typically what that looks like is you have a tool like chat GPT or Dolly or any of the image image generating tools and they'll release it to a short list of people internally first with the sole objective of trying to break it or trying to get it to go off the rails. And so they'll give it prompts that um, you know, are controversial or that generate. Uh, and so almost all of these have really prescribed, and it's not super obvious to everyone using it, but like it doesn't gener it's not allowed to generate hate speech. It, it's, many of the image generation tools aren't able to generate like an individual celebrity likeness, for example, um, ch child explorer. I mean, there are a whole set of um, things that they have identified as severe risks that there are already guardrails to those tools. But making that consistent, um, you know, something I think we all recognize is a journey and, you know, we're early in that journey. Questions from the audience and Ashley's going to bring the microphone. Hi, my name is Carla Clark. I'm a Trinity student. I have two questions for you. You mentioned back and you said that back in the 50s that AI was co-founded or founded. How do you come up with, how did you all or whomever came up with the name artificial intelligence? And I have one more question. Um, what is the percentage of companies that utilizes the A1 technology too. Um, so the the origins or some you know some of the writings and musing about technology behaving in ways that mimic human behavior, um, it actually even dates back you know much earlier than that, even like in the in the 1800s, sort of philosophers imagining technologies that that could um, behave in ways that are human like. I think what changed in the 50s is, um, you know, even even with a lot of the technologies in World War II and trying to crack the Enigma code, for example, there were massive mathematician um, advances that allowed mechanized, computerized um, uh, algorithms and mechanical calculations that could outperform human performance and. And that was really the origin of like in the 1940s and 50s and the very earliest days of you know what we now think of as computers, but massive room-sized mainframe computers that could um, conduct some of these tasks that 
that start to look more and more like human behavior. And so that's the, that, that was why we sort of cited the 1940s and 1950s, in part because of the computer, com computational and mathematical sort of sophistication advanced really significantly in, in that era. But the concept of like musing about technology starting to mimic human behavior was even, you know, even earlier than that. And then adoption of specific technologies, we you know, research and, and, and track that. The, um, the overall adoption levels, we, we ask it, in some of the, the state of AI research, every year we sort of ask adoption of all kinds of different AI capabilities, computer vision, ro pro robotic process automation, um, and we ask about it in a specific business unit or function, and we ask about it at scale across the organization. What's been surprising to us over the years is that that hasn't spiked close to 100%. That it, you know, that it, it, it sort of hovers around 50, 50, 55%. And the, the core challenge that we've observed is the changing these large companies to be able to implement these technologies. And so, you know, that, that was again sort of the, the thinking and the sort of reason for this book is that fundamentally to capture value from AI and from digital technologies at scale for a large company, the technology challenge is actually not the biggest challenge. It's the kind of organizational process rewiring um, to be able to, to accomplish it. Mm -hmm. yeah. which, is, which is counterintuitive too, because we're here talking about AI and a lot of times the questions do anchor on the technology. And so that's why in part we take this kind of broader you know, enterprise lens. There's a question over there and then there'll be one up here. Thank you very much, Mr. Hall, for your very insightful presentation. My name is Wairi Mwangi. I am faculty at, at Trinity. My question is, um, I have two questions, actually. The first one is, you talked about data, um, availab an increase in data availability. So how do we um, ensure data integrity, um, especially when we think about all the cases that we've um, experienced in the last few years of, for example, in academia, uh, the cases of data manipulation. So how, does, how do we continue to ensure data integrity and what do you see the, uh, uh, the role of AI uh, to be in that? And then, and then the second question is, um, when we think of AI, we're always wondering what is going to be the role of humans um, in the future? And my question is, because AI is based on predictability, does that mean that um, our role remains in disrupting that predictability? And what does that mean for AI if we disrupt the predictability? Oh. Yeah, great question. And, um, and I'll, try to, I'll try to do my best to answer those quickly, but th those are both sort of um, very thoughtful and questions we could talk about a lot. On the data quality one, it's a huge challenge. Um, there are some advancements in, uh, in using technologies to be able to detect anomalies. In the mining example, there are sensors throughout the mining operation. There, it's noisy, there's vibrations, there's, you know, they're hugely messy. If any of those sensors go out, it inputs bad data into the system. And so the, the first kind of mechanism of this AI model is to be able to filter and detect anomalies so that you don't get a radical kind of shift based on errors. But that's also an evolution. But you're absolutely right. I mean, with massive data sets, uh, part of the data quality and integrity is a, you know, a hugely important part of that. And on your second question, where we are now in most of these technologies, almost all of them, are that they are, their sweet spot, so to say, is in like a co-pilot capacity. Meaning there's, sometimes you'll hear human in the loop um, in the mining example, in the banking example, they, these are not ones that run completely autonomously. You know, pe people are sort of losing their jobs and not, not involved in them, but rather they become like a superpower that augment the human expertise, but it takes real human expertise and judge judgment and synthesis. Um, again, in the mining example, the metallurgists, the chemists, the mining experts, all of them are involved in making this AI engine work. In most of the other examples, they have not involved like um, layoffs or, or workforce reduction, but rather they are AI um, co-pilot equivalent 
things that elevate the performance of the organization and of individual employees. Thank you. And we have time for one more question, but I'm going to encourage Dr. Mwangi. I hope you can stay for the rest of the program because a lot of those questions are going to flow through the next two panels. Hi, Helen Mullen, uh, known as Berkey Mullen, class of 73, chemistry major, pre-med. But I ended, ended up being a science teacher, which got me with kids. Now I'm a social worker. Now I'm retired. My question is about um, some of the risks, the security risks. In our current society of vast polarization in our U.S. politics and vast differences in economic distribution of resources, what are the guardrails that you use, you know, that the information is true? You know, the elections of 2020, how do you, how do you guard against, how do any of these information chats or AIs, generative AIs, how do, what are the guardrails and what kind of regulations need to be in place? Because when I was teaching, Wikipedia may not have been, even existed, but it wasn't a viable resource. Yep. You had to go to the magazine. Yep. So, so also a, a, a wonderful and you know profound question. It, it's um, we aren't, we aren't there as a society in mitigating most of those risks. Um, and I think we've seen a number of things go off the rails. And I don't think it's, it's too controversial to say, like, if I predict, like, we will continue to see things go off the rails in certain contexts. Um, but I think collectively, everyone's trying to mitigate those, you know, as much as possible and identify the sources. I think it was Mark Twain who, you know, had some quote that, like, a lie can travel around the world before, you know, sort of, um, you probably know the quote better than I do, but, you know, it, it um, particularly in the context of like misinformation, deep fakes, it's a real challenge. And so companies are starting to identify you know ways that you would tag an image, um, but I don't think that's fully sufficient. Um, and so a lot of that will continue to need to continue to evolve. In part, it's, it it will need regulation in certain areas to create like really clear guardrails. Mm -hmm. um, there was an example of a lawyer who used a something generated by ChatGPT, and it cited a case that didn't even exist, um, but he didn't catch it. Um, you know, these things will just continue to happen, and that the tools are 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 too widely available and too compelling in so many the, the kind of lumpiness that we described. They're too good at so many at so many things that people will continue to use them, but we all need to like have heightened like antenna up around these areas where it's just not good at certain things. It does create a lot of information. It creates a lot of risk in areas that will continue to be um, made apparent as these tools, as these tools evolve. So, um, you know, I don't, and no one has a perfect answer to it other than to say, you know, we're all trying to figure out like these categories of risk and, tr you know, trying to mitigate them at a corporate level, a sector level, sort of a, you know, national and sort of you know, democracy level. Bryce Hall, thank you so much. Isn't he great? This has been a wonderful teeing up for our day. Thank you. And thank you, Haywan and Maria, for being with us as well.